such a sweetheart, man. I love this guy. <laughs> Does anybody have pain in their back, their lower back, like right in here someplace? Does anybody? I, I, I'm going to pray for you and then pray for you. What's your name? Hey, Barry. Barry. Hi, Barry. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Good to be seen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for Barry. Let, let's lift your hands in agreement. Lord, we just pray for Barry right now. We thank you, Lord, that you have set him apart for such a time as this to display your power and your glory. So I ask that your healing grace touch Barry's back, touch his muscles, Lord. Bring them at peace in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, I speak to your muscles, tendons, and ligaments. Be healed in Jesus' name. I speak peace in the name of Jesus. I command your spine to line up right now. Straighten in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, all pain be gone right now. Go in Jesus' name. Be healed in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. Barry, t test it out. See if you could touch the floor or do something you couldn't do. I've done that for a couple of years, but it's doing a lot easier. Okay, how does it feel? Any pain? Praise God. Let's give the Lord a hand. Thank you, Lord. All right, we've got to go over to Carl right now. We're going to just touch, have the Lord touch Carl. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we bless Carl. We thank you, Lord, for your power. We thank you for your abundant grace. We thank you that you are the Lord, our God, the healing God, the God of wonders and God of might and power. We thank you for your grace, Lord. So let your healing grace pour into, uh, into Carl's back right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we ask that, you're, that you would touch his muscles and tendons and ligaments, that every muscle would be at peace in Jesus' name. Lord, touch the nerves, Lord, in Jesus' name. Touch the nerves in his back right now. Touch the discs, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I command all inflammation cease in every disc. Amen. In Jesus' name, I speak peace into every disc right now. In Jesus' name, I command your spine to straighten. I command every muscle to be at peace right now. In Jesus' name, be healed. Be healed. In Jesus' name. Pain be gone. Stiffness go. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Okay, you test it out. Test it out. You got to do something you couldn't do. Can I pick you up? No. <laughs> That's, that was the problem, was lifting. All right. So lift the chair. See if it's any better. Lift the chair. chair. Yeah, lift the chair. Oh, significantly better. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's some other words of knowledge. We will pray for these afterwards. Right shoulder, left wrist, and fingers. Right ankle, right knee, and headache. If you have any of those things, afterwards we'll be delighted to pray for you. Praise God. Otherwise, we'd be here all day praying for you, which I, I could do that too. I don't mind doing that. I love doing that. But the Lord gave me a message to share, so I think it would be important to give that as well. So uh, last week, we began a new series, and the series is called Trusting God Through Fiery Trials. The truth is, every one of us, without exception, are going to encounter things in our life that is like a sucker punch into our solar plexus that knocks the wind out of us. We're never prepared for them. In fact, it usually happens when everything is going well. And that was the case with David. You remember everything was going well with David. You remember that he had defeated Goliath. He was uh, accepted into the palace of King Saul. He, his best friend was Jonathan. He was given uh, Saul's daughter to marry. He's living in splendor and glory. He's on top of the world. And then... Saul hears the ladies singing, Saul killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And he became insanely filled with jealousy and on several occasions tried to kill David and he escapes. And the army of Israel led by King Saul is after him and he finds himself in a cave surrounded by his enemies and things seem absolutely hopeless. But David says, I will not fear. Who will I dread? Here's a man that's seemingly in the most hopeless situation. His life is, is really on the chopping block, if you will. 
and he stood steadfast because God is the light of his salvation. This morning, we're going to talk about this next passage where David expresses his love for God's house. And in this passage of Scripture, he asks God for one thing, just one thing. Let me ask you this. If God showed up at night and you heard his audible voice and he said to you, ask me one thing and I will give it to you. And all you had is one thing that you could ask God for, guaranteed you're going to get it. What would you ask him? Some would ask for riches. Some would ask for power. Some would ask for a special healing. Some may even ask for power, prestige. Hezekiah asked for long life, and God gave him 15 years. Solomon asked for wisdom, and he got riches besides. That's not what David asks for. As I was looking at this passage, I, I was profoundly overwhelmed by what David asks God for. David says, one thing I ask, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Why would he ask that? Why wouldn't he ask for deliverance? I mean, for crying out loud, he's surrounded by an army. Why didn't he ask for power or prestige? Why didn't he ask for wealth? Why didn't he even ask for wisdom? Why didn't he ask that his destiny as king be fulfilled as was promised by Samuel in a prophetic word? I think the reason is because of David understood that there is nothing that satisfies greater than the presence of God. In Psalm 27, 4 and 5, David says, One thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in His temple. For the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on the rock. Will you bow with me as we pray? Papa God, I just ask in Jesus' name, by the power of your spirit, you would speak through this jar of clay, that I would decrease and you increase. I ask that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see. And, and Lord, even... Even for each one of us, even though we're different, different levels of intimacy with you, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would give us an open heart that each one of us might receive something that would benefit us this morning and that would propel us into a deeper level of intimacy, a deeper level of submission and obedience. In Jesus' name and for his sake. The reason that David loved the house of God is because the house of God is the place of God's presence. He says, one thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And the, and the house of the Lord that he's referring to is the tent of meeting, the tabernacle. You see, in the Old Testament, it's so different from the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the, the tabernacle was the place where the priests offered the sacrifices. It was there that the sacrifice was offered in order to cover sin. It was also the place of worship. It was also the, the gathering place of God's people. And what David is, as he's sitting in this cave, as he's surrounded by his enemies, he's longing to be in the place of the tent of meeting, the place where God inhabits, the place where God manifests his tangible presence to his people. He's longing for that. In fact, for David, the reason why he asks 
that, that he would dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life is because he knew that money doesn't satisfy the soul, power doesn't satisfy the soul, prosperity doesn't satisfy the soul. The, the, the soul is satisfied by one thing and one thing only, the presence of God. Only Jesus can satisfy the soul. Only He can bring peace and joy. Only He can, can light up one's life when all around Him is nothing but darkness and despair. You see, David understands that the world can't provide for him that which only God can provide, and that is the filling of the soul with joy and peace. And that's why in Psalm 1611, your memory verse for this week, that it says, David says, in your presence is the fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forever. You want joy? You spend time with Jesus. He's the one who satisfies our soul. He is the lover of our soul. And David understood that. But today, we, we live in the new covenant. Oh, praise God, we don't have to go to a tent to meet God. We don't have to go in a temple because you are the temple. If you know Christ, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, What? Do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you and you have of God and you are not your own? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which belongs to Him. You are the living host of God's presence. You are his tabernacle. <laughs> Do you know what that means? That means that you are the light of the world. That you host the presence of God and you could bring the presence of God into the darkest of places and change the light that is in there. You can change the atmosphere of every place that you go. Because we have Emmanuel, God with us. And even greater than that, God in us. But we have something even more special than that. We have the privilege to gather together. Do you know that church is not this building? It's merely, this building is merely a tool that God gives us. It's a nice tool. It's a beautiful tool. It's well kept. The deacons have done an outstanding job keeping this beautiful building, this tool for us to assemble together. But do you know that's not the church? The church is called ecclesia in the Greek, and it literally means the called out ones. That the church is the called out ones who assemble in the name of Jesus Christ. And our greatest purpose is to host collectively, the presence of God. In other words, our purpose, each one of us, as you begin to assemble, you're coming into the room, your whole purpose is God. I am going to collectively host the presence of God. That's your purpose. And we collectively host the presence of God through worship, through prayers, through the exercising of the spiritual gifts that God moves in us and through us, as someone by healing is touched by the finger of God, you literally carry the power and the presence of God Almighty. And when you come into the room, collectively, as you gather, you are increasing the presence of God because of what you bring. Each one of you who are in Christ have something to offer to the collective expression of the presence of God. It's amazing. That's the reason why we gather. The sole purpose is to host the presence of God because if God doesn't show up, we did not do church today. If God didn't show up, you might as well go shopping at Walmart because at least you get something. 
But you know, there are things that will hinder the presence of God. Did you know that? Unconfessed sin. Psalm 5.5, 5, the arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. Psalm 101.7 says, no one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. Let, let me explain to you something that happens in the Old Testament. You see, in the tabernacle, the high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies. And before he could even enter there, he had to consecrate himself. And, and so to consecrate himself, the first thing he did was he examined his life. He examined his heart. And, and if there was... If there was sin that God revealed in his life, he had to offer a proper sacrifice. He had to offer a blood sacrifice to atone for his sin. And, and then he wasn't done yet. He had to go and wash himself in a ritual cleansing, which was called the mikvah. And once he was ritually cleansed, he put on his priestly garments. And then he was prepared. But they tied a rope around his ankle. And they, tied, they put bells on his robe. And they did that for this reason, because if the high priest did not prepare himself adequately when he went into the Holy of Holies, if he offered a polluted sacrifice, if he offered a sacrifice that was not consecrated, if he was not holy, if he was not cleansed, he would fall like a rock dead right there. And then somebody had to retrieve him. Now let me ask you this. Would you, be, would you like to be the one that retrieves him? <laughs> Not me. So they pulled him out. <laughs> Whoop, we lost another one. But you see, in the New Covenant, we have the right and the privilege to enter the Holy of Holies any time, day, morning, evening, no matter what day of week it is, no matter what time, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, no matter what culture you're from, if you are in Christ, if you have repented of your sin and embraced the cross, you have confident access anytime into the Holy of Holies. But if you have unconfessed sin in your life, it will be a polluted sacrifice when you worship. It is then that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You see, the, the purpose of the cross work of Christ is so that at every moment, that when we find ourselves in sin, when we find ourselves alienated from God, when we find ourselves caught in a trespass, we have the privilege to go before the throne. God, forgive me. I repent. And then I accept the blood and is washed. I'm washed. I'm clean. I can go into the holy holies. I can experience your presence. And then as you experience his presence at home and as you walk with him throughout your day and you come to assemble, in fact, I know this morning when you got up, I'm looking at some very clean people. You washed, you took a shower, you brushed your teeth, you put on clean clothes so that you don't stink. You prepared the outside of the cup. But let me suggest to you that if we want the fullness of God in this place, you've got to clean the inside of the cup before you come. You've got to clean the inside of the cup. Because if you don't bring the inside of the cup, you're offering a polluted sacrifice in the collective assembly of the, of the believers. How many of you want to see greater breakthroughs in your life? I don't know about you, but I want to see greater signs, wonders, and miracles. And I know God 
is just waiting for us to come together collectively because when we come together collectively clean and holy, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband, I know God is going to move in ways that we have never even dreamed of, exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ever ask or think according to his power that so mightily works in us. Astounding grace upon grace. But we have to be consecrated. We have to clean the inside of the cup so that when we assemble together, what you bring to this body will be a crescendo of praise and glory to him. Another thing that hinders the presence of God is legalism. In Matthew 15, 7 and 8, Jesus said this to the religious leaders. He said, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teaching are but rules taught by men. Now, Jesus wasn't so <laughs> easy on the Pharisees, the scribes. In fact, he always called them on their hypocrisy. But you know what was happening during Jesus' day? What was happening is that the... The religious leaders broke the Ten Commandments up into 613 different rules and regulations. They, they truly believed that rules, that ceremony, that rituals please God. And so what happened is they became filled with a, a heart that judges others according to their own standard of righteousness, a righteousness that they couldn't even meet themselves. And they couldn't accept anyone that did not meet their standard of righteousness. In fact, some of the rules were so petty and, 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 and foolish. For instance, it, it, one, one such rule was this. On the Sabbath day, if you got bitten by a mosquito, you couldn't do this. That would have been considered work on the Sabbath day, and you broke the Sabbath. I mean, think about how foolish some of these rules are. I, I, I have a brother who's so legalistic. Oh, my word, I can't hang with him because it's so bad. I, I, I love him from a distance. <laughs> but he's the kind of guy that can say, well, you can't go to the movies, but he can rent an objectionable movie, sit in the quietness of his home, and violate his soul. I, I find it astounding. Legalism kills. It destroys. You know what the amazing thing about legalism is that you don't need the Holy Spirit to follow rules and regulations. There's absolutely no discernment. All you do is you have your list of do's and don'ts, you follow them, but the problem with legalism is you judge other people by your own standard of measure that you can't even match yourself. It brings condemnation. What usually happens with people who are legalistic is they judge other people and when they can't meet their own standard of righteousness, they go from legalism instantly into license. You know what license is? License says, you know what, I can't match that. I might as well do what I want to do. They lose hope. They don't walk in holiness. They don't walk in righteousness. God is not interested in rules and regulations. I know most of you know that. You know what God is interested in? Your heart. 2 Chronicles 16.9 says, The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, looking for those whose heart belongs completely to Him. You know, it's amazing. When we do something wrong, we don't need a rule telling us we did it. <laughs> when I do something wrong, Holy Spirit immediately tells me I did it. And I'm like, oh, that's a good thing, you know it? You know why that's a good thing? Because if you don't feel a sting, that means that something's dead inside. If there's no conviction of sin, something is wrong. That's why legalism is so bad, because there's no conviction. Traditionalism is another area that hinders the presence of God. 
In Mark 7, 8, it says, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. Jesus says, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Now, it's important to understand that during Jesus' day, worship became cold and lifeless. It became nothing but barren orthodoxy. It became dry. It resembled more of a dirge, a funeral service. They long since had abandoned the worship of David. Now, how many people ever read the Psalms about David's worship? Raise your hand if you read the Psalms. Uh, would you say it resembled a funeral? No. I what is it? What is, in fact, if you want to learn about worship, where do you go? You go to the Psalms. And, and you know, when we read about David, David celebrated. He danced and twirled unashamedly. <laughs> he lifted up holy hands with shouts of joy and victory and celebration. The trumpets were blaring. The banners were waving that there was absolute, complete, total abandonment in love for God. Complete abandonment. But by the time Jesus shows up, it's a dirge. It's dry. Barren orthodoxy. In fact, Jesus, he finds himself talking to this woman who is a Samaritan, and she discovers there's something different about this guy. She perceives that Jesus is a prophet. And she says to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. So where do we worship? On this mountain, Mount Gerizim, which is the place where the Samaritans worship, or in Jerusalem? Now, there's a reason why she asked that question. Because, see, on Mount Gerizim, the Samaritans were celebrative. They were zealous in the worship. They danced. They sang with a, with a passion and a zeal. And they played their instruments. It was a crescendo of praise to God. The problem was they didn't worship him according to truth. You see, this woman at the well understood the worship of Jerusalem was barren orthodoxy. She knew that it was a place of deadness and she was really, in a sense, testing Jesus. What's the right worship? So Jesus says, the time is coming, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship him in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such worshipers. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And what's interesting, when it says God is spirit, they that worship him in spirit and in truth, the word spirit and in truth is a different word from God is spirit. And the God is spirit is in the uh, capitalized in S, but human spirit is actually meaning spirited worship. In other words, that the worship that pleases God is spirited worship according to truth. In other words, God loves when his kids celebrate. I want to show you a passage of Scripture that I think is really fascinating. Acts 15, verses 15 and 16. It says, With the words of the prophet, uh, prophets agree, just as it is written, After these things I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it. Let me suggest to you that God is not saying He's going to build another tent. Remember now, the prophets... The prophets are speaking here, and they says, the tabernacle of David has fallen, and it's speaking far into the future, into the new covenant. Remember, when Jesus arrives, there is no celebration. And he's saying, remember, they have a temple there even. There's no celebration. It is barren orthodoxy. And the prophets are saying that the tabernacle of David will be rebuilt. Well, what is the tabernacle of David? It is celebrative, passionate, zealous, Worship according to truth with God's people who are unashamed to celebrate the king.
You know what that tells us? I love Pastor Troy preached my message at prayer time today. <laughs> you have a tendency to do that. <laughs> Here's the thing. Worship is not a spectator sport. Did you get that? Worship. <laughs> It is not a spectator sport. You know, I love football. I, I, I love going to football games. I'm as crazy at a football game as I am here. It's because I'm wired that way, you know? I mean, I think it's pretty cool God's wired. In fact, I, I, I think I'm, actually, I think I'm 90% Jewish. I got the spirit of David on me. <laughs> and unashamed about it. In fact, I'm, I, I think it's really cool. When we get into the house of God, there is no other people on the planet that has something more to celebrate than we do. I see people going crazy at a football game because a touchdown has been, has been scored. I can tell you this. I'm looking at 150 people who've got to score touchdowns every day. we got something to celebrate. We've been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. We've been given every promise of God, which is yes and amen. We've been given the Holy Spirit, whereby we have everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. Who in the world has more to celebrate than we do? And if that were not enough, we get to go to heaven. Ha <laughs> ha! Wow! I always say life is too short for a bad day. But when you're heaven, there's no bad days. That's what's really cool about heaven. No bad days. No pain, no sorrow, no crying, no tears. I don't know about you, but that's something to celebrate. But there's other reasons why David said, I will dwell. One thing I ask that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Because he understood that the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, the Lord's house, was a place to behold his beauty. He says to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. You know what he was meditating on? He was meditating on the goodness of God, on his majesty. He was meditating on the kindness and grace of God. Think about this for a minute. When David watched the high priest take this innocent little lamb and slaughter it, and then that this priest had to take a hyssop plant, dip it in the blood. This, this animal, this innocent animal got slain on his behalf. The innocent must be slain on behalf of the guilty. And then this priest takes this hyssop plant, dips it in blood, sprinkles it on the, also, on the altar, on the mercy seat, as an atoning act to cover his sin. When David is in the tabernacle and he's meditating on the kindness of God, that God has dealt with his sin problem once and for all. As he's thinking per prophetically about Messiah who would come, who would die in his place and for his sin, so that he would be set free. He's meditating on grace, forgiveness, restoration, reconciliation. As he's singing songs which exalt the Lord, he's meditating on God's glory, His majesty, His goodness. That's why we gather. I will love the Lord's house passionately. It was also a place of safety, a place of refuge. David writes, for in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. Here, here's David. I mean, think about this. Here he is sitting in a cave surrounded by the army of Israel. He's, he, he's asking God to dwell in his tabernacle so that he would conceal him and 
give him a place of refuge. It doesn't make sense, does it? The truth is, David knows he's already in a place of refuge. He already knows that God will, will, will save him. In fact, that's why he says, I will not fear. God is my light. He's my salvation. He's my deliverer. You know what he's saying, actually? That when he is in the presence of God, that there is absolutely no oppression, that there is no demonic force that can beat him down with depression, oppression, or torment of any kind. It is a place of safety and security where the enemy cannot touch him. And he's not talking about a human enemy. He's talking about the demonic forces that attack his soul. Folks, you know what that means for us? That means because we host the presence of God, because we are the holy habitation of God, we do not have to walk in depression, oppression, or demonic torment. Let me just share with you what I mean by that. I want you just to picture this for a minute. Picture this aisle as the safety and security of the presence of God. Remember now, Scripture says, Galatians 5.16, Walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the cravings of your sinful nature. Right? And so... As you're walking in the Spirit, there is safety, there is security. You are kept by the power of God for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In, the, in His presence is the fullness of joy. In His right hand are pleasures forever. You're walking with Him. You're filled with the Spirit. That out of, the, out of that Spirit, the fruit comes. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That you're walking in the pleasures of God. You're walking in the provision of God. You're walking in the power and the authority of God. There is safety in this room. There is safety in the presence of God. You're enjoying the freedom that you have with God. But on either side, on either side, and it's not you, by the way, but I'm using this as an illustration. On either side, there are demons there. Well, it's not you, okay? <laughs> but the demon is saying, hey, I got something better. Open this door of lust. It's a good thing. It'll make you feel good. Hey, your brother, look what he did to you. Your brother offended you. You have the right to hate him. Oh, do I really? Oh, you know what I just did? I stepped into the kingdom of darkness. And I opened the door that the enemy now has the right to buffet and torment me. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, In your anger do not sin, do not let the sun go down upon your wrath, and do not give the devil a what? Foothold. A foothold. That word foothold carries the idea of a place in which the enemy has occupied. He does not own you, he does not possess you, but he's occupied a place in your life where he now can launch further attacks. A door of offense has been opened up. And you have a choice now. You can come into agreement with that spirit of offense in which he taunts you, tempts you, seduces you, and then he tortures you. That's how the enemy works. There is no safety outside of the kingdom of God. None. There is nothing more than oppression, depression, pain, anxiety, worry, fear, and every kind of oppressive thing that the enemy will throw on you. There's only one way back, the cross. It's the only way back. It's the cross. It's agreeing with God, God, I've offended you. I consecrate myself. I repent of my sins. I lay them at the cross. Lay your burdens there too. 
burdens also are used by the enemy to oppress you. Did you know that? Did you know that a burden is nothing more than a weight that you're not designed to carry? And what happens when you carry them? You step over here because you're saying God's not big enough. He doesn't care enough, nor can he take care of my need because he's too busy or doing something else. That's why it says in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles and let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith who for the joy set before us endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Folks, the righteous ones shall live by what? That was really weak. <laughs> Let's try that again. The righteous ones shall live by what? Faith. That was much better. By faith. Not fear. Not oppression. Not anxiety not torment. The righteous ones shall live by faith, and as you walk with him in the Spirit, you are filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. We host... The God of the universe, the King of glory, indwells us. We have it all. But as Pastor Troy mentioned today, when you come into that testing or temptation, however you want to look at it, you're at a crossroads. Am I going to walk in light of his kingdom? Am I going to choose to walk with him? Or am I going to listen to that dark, demonic voice that is calling away from the simplicity and purity of my devotion to Christ? And when you find yourself over here and you're filled with sorrow and sadness and oppression, and all the other nonsense that comes with it, then your and your joy meter just went. Zzz. Gotta get back. And then what you have here, a heavenly father saying, Come on, it's already paid for, let's go. Come back. There's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. God's not even mad at you when you're over there. He's just saying, boy, I wish they'd get it because they're having a really bad day. <laughs> He's not having a bad day. He loves you just the same now as you are when you're over here. It's the only thing is that the enemy's over here beating the snot out of you, laughing at you. Because you opened a door you shouldn't have opened. But you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay in offense. You don't have to be embittered. You don't have to stay in lust. You don't have to stay in, 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 in violence with your lips. You don't have to stay in those places. There's a reason. Let me say this, folks. I'm going to wrap it up. There's a reason why in Romans chapter 3, it says the poisonous vipers is under their lips. You know what a viper is? It's a snake. It's a spirit. It's a serpent spirit. And you cannot come into agreement with it. A serpent spirit will always speak negatively, accusatory. Remember, who's the accusing? Who's the accuser of the brethren? The devil. That serpent spirit always accuses, always judges, always condemns always curses. We do not have to come into agreement with that. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. Freedom. And when you're walking in freedom, <laughs> what a good day. 
Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Oh, Papa God, we bless you. We hallow your great name. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the blessings. We thank you, O oh God, that we have a way out, that we do not have to walk in brokenness, that we do not have to walk in despair, that we do not have to walk in pain, that we don't have to walk in sorrow. Lord, we thank you for Holy Spirit. And Lord, we just ask in Jesus' name that, Lord, that if we find ourselves on the other side of your kingdom, Lord, that we will come running back to you. Because we know your arms are stretched wide. And we know that your arms, in your arms is the place of blessing, it's the place of joy. Oh God, help us to love your house passionately in Jesus' name. Let's stand as we sing this last song.
He is a good, good Father. This is who He is. I want to encourage you, when you're going to go home this week, just remember what was said today, what Pastor Chris preached, and what. remember that you are not alone. Remember that angels is always with you. Holy Spirit is always inside of you. And there is nothing too small that He cannot help you, or you always can count on Him. So, and if you struggle with something, if you see something in your life, it's coming up again and again and again, and you cannot deal by yourself, that's why you have a church family. That's why we have some ministries here. We have Soza ministry. We have deliverance ministry. And don't be ashamed. We all went through this a couple times. Just, just sign up, and we will help you. Because we want to walk in freedom, and we want to, because there is freedom in his kingdom. So I want to encourage you to walk in, in the peace of God, to worship him every day in your quiet time. When you're driving, come on, sometimes we're driving for 30, 40, one hour, one way to work on, or somewhere else. Worship him. Spend that time to celebrate your father. So, Lord, I bless, I bless us for this week, Lord. I ask you to fill us with your peace. I ask you to fill us with your faith because the faith of God is, is a gift. I ask you increase the gift in us, Lord Jesus. I ask for your protection, for your angels to protect us everywhere we go. And I ask you to stir up the hunger for more of you, Lord Jesus, that we will never be satisfied where we're at. I bless your name in Jesus' name. I bless you, and if you have any prayer need right now, we have a, wor- a prayer team in the front coming up for prayer. Be blessed and celebrate his presence. Amen. And I should have come up with some noise today because I, I see something going on, like Pastor Troy released a couple noises today, Pastor Chris during the message. So I think I need to come up with something else, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> I'm going to say something. Woohoo! Yes, I released the noise.